Uh, David Hume basically says that the laws of nature have established, have been established, I should say, through extensive and consistent experience, rendering them as certain as empirical beliefs can be. And so every day we get up, we experience the law of gravity, we experience the laws of nature, uh, we know that they're firm and pretty much for the, you know, unalterable, we experience them all the time, we have tons of evidence for them. Human testimony, on the other hand, is a little hinky, right? It's people aren't consistently truthful, people lie. And people often make mistakes. People think they see Elvis. People think they see Bigfoot. Um, people lie about seeing Elvis and Bigfoot. And so people make mistakes. People aren't truthful. Human testimony uh, isn't as firm as, you know, say the laws of gravity, right? Even if humans were unfailingly honest and never mistaken, their testimony strength could only match but not surpass the evidence that we possess for the laws of nature. And so this is Hume's argument basically in a nutshell. So we should always prioritize the stronger evidence our everyday human experience with the laws of nature pretty much surpasses the laws of human or the laws of human testimony surpasses what we know about human testimony. And so here's Hume's argument in a meme. We have the laws of nature versus human testimony. Um, here's the problem. Hume can't mean science tells us what nature does when it's left to itself. Great. But nature or science, on the other hand, doesn't tell us if nature is left to itself. That's scientism. That's importing a philosophical belief about the world. You're just assuming that nature is all that there is. But science itself doesn't tell us if nature is actually left to itself. And so here's a problem with Hume's argument is that it's actually a false dilemma. Recognizing a miracle would only be possible if there existed a stable and consistent natural order against which a miracle will stand out. Just think about this for just a second. What do we know about, like, say, the Exodus story? Why did Moses say, I must turn aside and see this great sight when he saw a burning bush that wasn't consumed? He's like, hmm, uh, to, to quote Midwesterners, and I am a Midwesterner, that's different. <laughs> and so he's like, what's going on? I must see what's happening here. This is something that stands out against the normal laws of nature, right? Um, and so for miracles to serve as signs of the supernatural, they must be infrequent deviations of the usual workings of nature. They have to stand out against the backdrop of the, the natural order of things. And so Hume is actually presenting the world a false dilemma. And he was actually responded to by uh, William Adams and uh, William Paley uh, and um, George Campbell and others who I highly recommend going back, just look up their uh, names and search miracles or Hume, and you will find things that you can download for free right off of Google Play Books and read. He was actually responded to in his own times. People act like Hume is just like, has this undefeatable argument that no one has answered. No, it's not true. He was actually responded to uh, by his contemporaries. Now you might say, well, Eric, you know, extraordinary claims require, require extraordinary evidence or uh, a Cree followed by the re sound um, you usually get uh, when people talk about uh, this particular slogan. Guess what? I don't think that this slogan is necessarily bad. Extraordinary claims requiring much more indeed, even extraordinary evidence than ordinary occurrences due to their initial likelihood based on our background information. I, I think you ought to have good evidence if you're making an extraordinary claim. I think you have, better have very good evidence. You just have to define, and, and this is what I would say, here's something on as far as how to be a better atheist. When you're making this particular claim and you quote this slo slogan of Carl Sagan's, say what you mean by extraordinary, okay? Because oftentimes when I'm talking with skeptics, when I'm talking with atheists, when you guys say extraordinary claims require extraordinary evidence, you don't fill in what extraordinary is. Do you need to see an arm grow out right in front of your eyes? Um, do you need to have God himself appear to you? Does, does, do you need the, the Doubting Thomas treatment? Do you need to you know, touch the, the, the wounds, <laughs> you know, see the scars and behold, it's me with, with friends present. Like, what do you mean by extraordinary? Um, and so I think it's a fair thing to say extraordinary claims require extraordinary evidence, but just define what you mean by extraordinary. I think a defensible version of it is to say even really small probabilities, even if they're really, really tiny, if they're really remote, could potentially be proven true if we have enough high quality testimonial evidence. And so here is Thomas Sherlock, who was writing when Hume was just a, re la a wee lad. Um, Sherlock actually predated Hume in this whole Dias controversy thing. He says in the book, The Trial of the Eyewitnesses, which again, you could download for free off of Google Play Books. There are so many awesome free books from the Dias controversy. It's just crazy. Um, you, you just get lost forever. Uh, but he says, I do not allow 
that this case and others of like nature, discussing the resurrection, require more evidence to give them credit than ordinary cases do. You may therefore require more evidence in these than in other cases, but it is absurd to say that such cases admit no evidence when the things in question are quite manifestly objects of sense, okay? And so if you are an atheist and you're at, I don't know, Skepticon or something, and you're you're standing next to Matt Dillahunty and Aaron Ra and like five of your skeptical buddies, and I'm there and you are there with say a friend who you know is, uh, I don't know, he's got one arm. And I come up to him and I say, hey, arm, grow in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, that'd be awesome if I could do that. Uh, and it grew. And there was just witnesses there. And like Dill Hunt, he's like, oh, yeah, I believe. You know, and Abra's like, oh, yeah, I believe. And they convert and they lose their, you know, their YouTube channels and all that other stuff and, and whatever positions they have um, in, in the atheist uh, online community and activist community or whatever. Um, and all that other stuff, and they testify it uh, to it. Okay, well, you know, you may not have camera evidence, you may not have pics, okay, but you have testimonial evidence, and it seems like it's pretty good testimonial evidence. Um, then I think that would be enough to overcome a low prior probability. And so maybe that's a weird illustration, but Christians have agreed with this particular thing. And here is Charles Babbage, um, a base Chad mathematician, inventor, mechanical engineer, and philosopher, and father of basically the modern computer, um, writing, you know, way ahead of time for the modern computer, as you can tell by the, the picture here. Um, but anyway, he says that if independent witnesses can be found who speak truth more frequently than falsehood, it is always possible to assign a number of independent witnesses, the improbability of the falsehood, which concurring testimony shall be greater than the impossibility of the miracle itself. And so basically he's saying that there is enough evidence from testimony that would overturn any kind of a low prior. Uh, in other words, if the facts can easily be explained by assuming that a miracle occurred, but with not without significant difficulty, if we assume that a miracle didn't occur, then the facts strongly support the idea that a miracle occurred. On any plausible background assumptions, if Jesus died and physically rose, then the likelihood of theism is nearly one. That's why we're talking about resurrection. That's why I'm jumping right into resurrection. I'm not talking about arguments for the existence of God and why you should reconsider theism or anything else like that. Um, what I am saying is that if there's more evidence in favor of the miracle and the explanations against it actually being a miracle are more ad hoc, lack explanatory value and scope. And all of that, you know, kind of stuff is just like the explanation becomes more contrived than the simple explanation. Then that is evidence for a miracle. So Hume was probably wrong. Any ground for assigning low initial probability to the claim that a miracle has happened cannot be greater than the rational prejudice against the conjunction of two claims. One, that God possibly exists so that atheism is possibly false, there possibly is a God, and if it's possibly true that God has destined humans for a future state of existence. Um, if God wants to tell people about a, a very important message, I don't know really what other way that he can do it other than a miracle. And so if these two claims are possibly true, Miracles aren't improbable. They are actually like inevitable at some point in history that somebody is going to, to witness them. And so if these two things are possibly true, then I'm sorry, Hume is wrong. There can be enough evidence to overcome. You have to have a way of knowing that you're wrong, okay? This, this is a question that I like to ask skeptics all the time. If, if you're going to say that Hume is right, well, how can you ever know that you're wrong? How could you know that a miracle happened? other than you yourself personally witnessing it, experiencing it.